you very much, Nick. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about not only paleontology, but spe specifically about paleontology in Antarctica, which is a kind of an environment not very unusual for most scientists, and um, even for, especially for paleontologists, actually, to work on. Uh, so, just to introduce to you, well, of course, Antarctica is in the south part of the planet. Basically, it's the frozen continent, as well as uh, uh, known as the frozen continent down there. And basically, it's uh, it's divided into two main regions: the east and west of Antarctica. And it has this uh, region called the Antarctica Peninsula, which is a kind of a tail that has the continent here and which is close to South America. And it's where actually most of the scientific research on paleontology is done in Antarctica. Uh, in general, for science, researchers are uh, research is done in this region and also in the South Pole region where uh, we have some very big and important scientific stations work uh, with developing scientific research. Uh, some basic facts about Antarctica that perhaps you are not aware of include the fact that it's a uh, 14 million square, square kilometers uh, continent in terms of surface area, so it's 15% bigger than Canada. Uh, it's the only continent without all political divisions, so it's an area dedicated only and exclusively to scientific research and to promote uh, commonwealth, let's say, among countries. So it's supposed to be uh, an environment free of political disputes. Uh, it represents also 10% of Earth's continental surface, and also it's covered by an ice cap, which can reach up to 5 kilometers of thickness. So important facts about the climate is that it's a dry environment, it's extremely dry. It's actually a desert. So it's as dry as the Sahara Desert. It actually has less than 100 millimeters of precipitation each year. So it basically, you, it's really difficult to see any kind of rain or snow in there. Uh, but it has really strong winds, which can reach up to 270, 27 kilometers per hour. It has an uh, annual temperature average of minus 60 degrees Celsius in the interior of the continent. So, of course, we are used to that mountain weather, which is actually very cold, but it doesn't reach an annual low average temperature of minus 60 degrees. And, uh, of course, on the outside of the continent, close to the ocean, it's much warmer, and it's also, uh, it's also in a less uh, high latitude, so it's a little bit far from the south pole, so it makes it a little bit warmer. And we have the oldest temperature ever record on Earth, uh, record in uh, about 10 years ago, I believe, in the south pole, in uh, Vladivostok station, a Russian station, which is minus 89.2 degrees Celsius. So, even though it's a very cold and dry environment, uh, it's about 145 up to 55 million years ago, Antarctica was an extremely different place. It was uh, uh, a relatively humid environment with temper uh, temperate climate, so it had a uh, much higher annual rainfall, it had a very diverse vegetation and also uh, many different kinds of animals that were inhabiting Antarctica at that time. So we had especially Gymnosperms, which are plants without uh, uh, seed plants without flowers, which include here uh, our parents, some seeds and uh, ginkgos. So most of these plants here are mostly common in the southern hemisphere and were present in Antarctica at that time. So one of my objectives here are to try to explain how can we study the past life in Antarctica as well as why it was such a warm place and it's, it was so different from what it is today. And how it ha has it turned into a prison desert as it is known today, and how life changed in Antarctica during the past 145 million years. 
So we're going to try to do that briefly, but uh, to begin with, uh, we actually study Antarctica stats by some different methodologies, which includes uh, using the current distribution of different species of animals and plants. So see the distribution of species present in South America and Australia, for instance, which once were connected to Antarctica can let us know a little bit about uh, which not animals perhaps inhabited Antarctica in the past. Also, geochemistry. So we can know about from the ice cores that scientists take from Antarctica, as well as from data from the rocks, which kind of chemicals were present in the past in Antarctica, as well as fossils, of course. So we have fossils of plants and animals, and that's where paleontology uh, comes in and gives us a lot of evidence from its past life. And we do that by doing uh, specific field trips to Antarctica where we are able to actually uh, get some information directly from over there. Uh, and it's done uh, usually during summertime in Antarctica. Uh, and here we have a picture of the a team from the National Museum in Rio, which, uh, where I did my master's, and where when some of my colleagues actually went there to collect some fossils from Antarctica and uh, during the year of 2007 to James Ross Island on the peninsula of Antarctica. So here we have uh, the map of Antarctica once again. And here in the, this tail bit region of Antarctica we have uh, James Ross Island right at the tip of this peninsula. And here you can actually see the peninsula over here at the back on the back of the picture, and on the foreground of the picture we have James Ross Island, where most of the paleontological research is done on Antarctica, actually. And of course, uh, we have some kind of unusual things that we have to face when you are in a field trip to Antarctica. So one of the things are, of course, the freezing temperatures, because even in this part of Antarctica, which is the hottest, warmest, part of Antarctica, we may have temperatures that during summertime that are in between uh, 0 degrees or plus 5, but they can drop to minus 10, minus 15 during the summer. So you can only do work during summertime, and even then you, can, you may have to, fight to face uh, snow and ice. Uh, and of course permafrost, perma which is frozen soil. So for people who want to dig, dig stuff, it's very difficult to actually work in this kind of environment. And of course the wind. Actually the wind is the worst thing in Antarctica because even though you have frozen soil, sometimes you can find some fossils in the surface, but you always have to face the wind. And actually the wind is bad because not only it makes it worse, to work, but also it enhances the uh, weathering of the fossils which are exposed on the surface. So it causes a lot of damage to the material we collect there. And, and I, of course, the, one of the worst things about work, working in Antarctica, one of the more problematic ones in terms of logistics, is that you become isolated from the entire world. You don't have internet access, you don't have roads, you don't have food, you don't have anything. So you have, you have to get to the place, stay camped for at least a month, and you have to stay in tents without shower or anything for more than a month. <laughs> and what actually happens is that it's even difficult to reach that place, because there is a lot of sea on the surface of the ocean surrounding this island. So this specific team had to have three different attempts of reaching the island before they finally were able to go through the ice and get to James Ross Island. And when they wanted to leave the island, it, the ice was just too big, they couldn't leave the island, so they had to be rescued by helicopters because there was no way to leave the place and they were running out of food, so there was no other option. So these are some of the challenges in there, but even so, and even have these harsh weather conditions, you are, we were still able to recover some of this very important material, including, including fossilized trees, uh, tons and tons of invertebrates, as well as uh, plant material, including mollusks. And 
which is of particular interest of myself and some of my colleagues, uh, fossil vertebrates, including fish, especially shark and the remains of a mesosaur, which uh, was described by myself and my previous supervisor in Brazil and turned out to be the oldest known mesosaur from Antarctica, and which is in exposition in exhibition in the National Museum of Rio de Janeiro. So if you have any chance of going to Rio, please visit the museum as well. Um, so now that we have some idea of how to study these uh, materials from Antarctica, uh, why was Antarctica actually such a warm place in the past? To begin with, we have to see which was the position of Antarctica in the past. So, as we know, the continents could uh, drift apart from each other, they moved around, and for a long time Antarctica was actually not in the South Pole, it was a little bit higher, it was closer to the equator, and uh, as you can see here, it's so Antarctica was a little bit on this portion here, so it was in the southern hemisphere, but not in the South Pole. <coughs> and actually, during that time, of course, it was a much warmer place because it was a little bit higher, and we have the oldest small dinosaurs actually known from this time frame. Uh, so we had Creolophosaurus and Lassialisaurus, Lassialisaurus, which are two dinosaurs known from this region and they are known from the mountains right at the center and heart of Antarctica. And also some pterosaur bones that were recovered from this region, so we know we had also pterosaurs in Antarctica in the past. Uh, but then, from this position which was a little bit uh, still south, but not so much to the south, during the Cretaceous, Antarctica moved to its present position on the South Pole. So, once it reached the South Pole, as we can see here, of course the temperature started to drop, but it, they were still warm, warm temperatures, and we had an average, uh, uh, sorry, uh, temperatures ranging between 0 and 24 degrees, as estimated for the outside of Antarctica, and between 9 and 14, so a, a smaller range of temperatures during uh, when it finally went straight into the South Pole here. Uh, and in South Pole itself, it was between 0 and 5 degrees Celsius. So it was not that cold. Of course, it was much colder, but not very cold. Far from the minus 89 that we can face there today. And there are some explanations for that. One of them is that during the Cretaceous period, which is when Antarctica got to that position, which was actually in between, so over here, uh, between 145 and 65 million years ago, way back here, uh, it was a much warmer period for some reasons, including the fact that we had intense volcanic activity in the West Pacific region, so it released a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere, and it created a greenhouse effect that actually warmed up the whole planet. Not only Antarctica, the whole planet was much warmer. And also the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, the South Atlantic Ocean, because during the Cretaceous, uh, South America drifted apart from Africa and opened this gap in between where this South Atlantic emerged, and this uh, created a gateway for exchange of water between the equator region and the South Pole region, so we would have better circulation of water. Uh, during that time. So it's all created a much warmer environment. So that's why I'm going to here focus on some uh, aspects of life ever since the Cretaceous, especially because this was the period where Antarctica was in its present position, it should be a lot colder, but it wasn't, and how it actually became as cold as it is today. So, uh, Right at the beginning of the Cretaceous year, around 145 million years ago, we had this exuberant vegetation, not with flower plants, because they were not uh, they were just appearing in the planet at this time during the beginning of the Cretaceous, but we have a huge diversity of other kind of plants, including plants which are still present today in the southern hemisphere, including polycarps, araucarium, uh, conifers, cicads, and ginkgos. At the same time, 
we do not have much direct data from Antarctica because uh, we do not have rocks exposed free of uh, outside uh, in the regions free of ice that we can uh, use to study and collect fossils from that time frame. But in this region here, where Antarctica used to connect with Australia, in the border between Australia and Antarctica, we collected some lots of fossils from dinosaur, pterosaurs, and other uh, animals that certainly, certainly were already present in Antarctica as well. Uh, also, amphibians, turtles, mesosaurs, which are marine reptiles, insects, spiders, and earthworms. <coughs> And just a little bit after that, the first flowering plants arrived in Antarctica, represented by this specific family called Chlorantaceae. So this family eventually uh, was the first kind of flowering plant in Antarctica. And at the end of the Cretaceous, actually flowering plants became the dominant kind of vegetation in Antarctica. Uh, one very common plant in Antarctica, which is also still present in many uh, modern continents in the southern hemisphere is Notophagus, which arrived in Antarctica during the Middle Cretaceous. And by the end of the Cretaceous, we have more dinosaurs being collected from Antarctica. Actually, the end of the Cretaceous is where we have most of the data from the warm, like Antarctica. So we have dinosaurs like this ankylosaur called Antarctopelta, and we have sauropod, uh, remains of sauropods, which are the dinosaurs with the huge long necks, uh, but we do not have any native species because we have only some vertebrae from that, but it was just published last year, so it's a kind of a very new thing. Uh, we also have theropod dinosaurs, which are the Velociraptor looking like dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. So uh, we have specific kinds of pteropods called Dromiosaurids. Uh, and also we have some herbivore dinosaurs uh, such as Trinosaurus and uh, some which is an ornithopod dinosaur and also teeth from a hatchosaur. So we have these varieties of herbivore and carnivore dinosaurs from Antarctica as well as other reptiles such as marine reptiles. So, uh, I showed an example of Pisasaur that was recovered from Antarctica, which are these Loch Ness monster looking like creatures, and we also had Mosasaurs, which were, uh, which are, uh, <coughs> sorry, were uh, lizards that adapted to an aquatic lifestyle, and uh, both went extinct along with the dinosaurs around 65 million years ago. Uh, so some of the mosasaurs we have here, we have this Animosaurus antarcticus uh, and including this, among the plesiosaurs we have this uh, baby plesiosaur called Maurisaurus, we call it from Antarctica in 2007 and also uh, Aristonectus, which is a common, very common plesiosaur from the southern hemisphere. And we also have turtles, aquatic turtles, including the oldest known turtle from the Antarctic continent, and a lot and lots of sharp material, which probably represented uh, at least a dozen species of sharks from that period in Antarctica. <coughs> However, at the end of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs, uh, apart from birds, and other, all of these other reptiles, some other organisms went extinct including the pisosaurs, mosasaurs, pterosaurs, and marine invertebrates like ammonites, which are these uh, mollusks, which are very close relative to modern day squid and octopuses. So everything was gone, gone basically by the end of the Cretaceous, and it was replaced by a new kind of fauna and vegetation during the Cenozoic era, which is the one right after the time series. But the thing is, it was still a very warm place. Antarctica was a very warm environment still, and it was uh, colonized by uh, majorly flowering plants, like the Myrtaceae plants. And it's the first time that we see some modern day animals in Antarctica. So this is when the penguins arrived in Antarctica. Right at the end of the Paleocene, that's around 55 million years ago. So at this time, we had penguins, and they were huge. They were one point two meters tall, which is a very big for, uh, for a penguin, 
the modern emperor penguin, which is the biggest living one, has around one meter in, uh, high, in height. So they were really big. And it actually contradicted some theories that penguins evolved some large size because of cold climate. As we found that uh, penguins in a very warm environment in Antarctica, now we know that the large size of penguins did not evolve because of cold temperatures. <coughs> And uh, after the Pegasus, actually, it's when Antarctica started to have some of its cold temperatures that it has today. So it began, the temperatures began to drop. Uh, on the surface of the ocean around Antarctica, the temperatures started to drop from 19 to 11 and 7 degrees during the Eocene. It's when we have the first continental glaciations and the first presence of ice on the sea around Antarctica. <coughs> And it will result in a decrease of 47% of the floral diversity. So the diversity of plants decreased a lot during that period, especially floral plants. Yeah. So as far as I know, is this contact the ice age that we're on Alberta? Uh, no, no, no. I can ask you your answer, your questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, in animals, we had the extinction of most sharks and rays during that area. Even though we had all this decreasing diversity, we still had reptiles, which are kind of animals that do not tolerate very good conditions present in Antarctica, including turtles, leatherback turtles, and crocodiles. So the only evidence of crocodiles we have from Antarctica is from use. So it was getting cold, but not that much yet. And it's when we have the first record of cetaceans, which include dolphins and uh, whales. So, on present time, whales are extremely common in Antarctica. They feed on krill, which are tiny crustaceans that live over there. And the first appearance of them was quite in the middle of the Eocene uh, stage. Uh, but when we get to the Oligocene, that's around 28 million years ago, then the temperatures get seriously, seriously cold. Then we have the widespread presence of marine ice all around Antarctica. And at that time, we had the complete separation, uh, also the complete separation of Antarctica from South America and Australia. That helped to decrease the so-called Circle Antarctic Current. Uh, I'm talking about this because currently, this current of uh, that of water that runs around Antarctica in modern days is essential for the dissipation of heat that comes from all the oceans of Earth, uh, the biggest oceans on Earth, which are the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. And it helps to spread the heat around the planet. So it's essential for modern day climate on Earth. And it first developed around 25 million years ago. Actually, it's also contributed to a lot of uh, the enhanced erosion of uh, on the continents because of the ice that was melting during summertime. Uh, lots of nutrients that were present in the uh, continent got uh, were carried by the melting ice to the sea, and also the different Antarctic currents helped to distribute these nutrients around Antarctica. So it enhanced it, it increased a lot the primary productivity in uh, the ocean surrounding Antarctica. So basically it helped to boom the amount of phytoplankton, which are tiny algae, and also zooplankton, which are tiny animals that live on the water, and also serve as food to whales. Curiously, at the same time, there was a boom in the first appearance of the toothless whales called Mississippi. They want to actually feed on this zooplankton. That led scientists to conclude that actually the development of this circumductive current eventually led to the evolution of the toothless whales, which are extremely common still today in southern oceans. Uh, when we get to the Miocene, which is around <coughs> between 23 and 5 million years ago, we finally have the formation of the permanent ice cap that we have in Antarctica today. So this 5 kilometers thick amount of ice started to develop at that time. 
basically, and it eventually led to the extinction of all foreign plants, including notophagus. So this was gone as well. And basically, Antarctica developed a tundra like vegetation. So Antarctica actually was more like northern Canada today. But soon after that, eventually, even that went out. So all superior kind of plants, the genus birds, flowering plants, all of them eventually were gone, and it was replaced only by moss and fern uh, plants. And uh, only two leading species of flowering plants are actually present in Antarctica, but not in the continent, only in some small islands surrounding Antarctica, which are much more actually. And eventually, some of the animals which are also famous in Antarctica, which are the pinnipeds, which include seals, sea lions, and walruses, they uh, eventually, uh, sorry, walruses are not present in Antarctica, in this case, only seals and sea lions, they uh, were only found from some fossils which were present ever since the Pleiopistocene. Uh, so it's basically very recent uh, material, and uh, even though it's quite recent actually, we have some fossils from the Miocene of South Africa and Australia. So we have a clue that perhaps they were already present much before that, perhaps as far back as 10 or 15 million years ago in Antarctica, but we currently do not have fossil, fossils from uh, these animals from that period of time. So just to conclude, uh, even though we are frozen continent today, uh, this kind of cold environment was a recent development in ge the geological history of Antarctica. Uh, at least as, uh, if we consider only the time period that Antarctica reached, finally reached the South Pole. So, <coughs> also, we, are also uh, we have uh, searched for fossils for less than 50 years in Antarctica. Actually, most of the scientific research done in Antarctica has been carried out in a very short span of time. And it's quite limited as well, especially because Antarctica is this a huge icy continent, and paleontologists, in special, cannot dig, they cannot reach the soil because of this five kilometers thick layer of ice. So, of course, there is very few spots in Antarctica where some field work can be carried out, especially in the uh, Antarctic Peninsula over here and in the Transantarctic Mountains, which are these mountains over here. So we have very few data, but still we were able to recover a lot of the history of uh, flight on Antarctica from this few scattered data. And the thing is, what mysteries may lie under this 5 kilometers thick layer of ice that stays is still present in Antarctica today. So that's something that uh, perhaps we will not uh, uh, ever know, but it's still something to wonder about. So uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Well, usually we have the same tools that we carry all 
used for any other kind of paleontological field trips, which include jagged hammers, uh, pigs, uh, geological hammers, so very heavy tools to, to work. But in that case, actually, we did not have, actually, the guys who went for that did not have to use much stuff because uh, the deposits that were found were mostly on the surface. Because every year the National Highest like digs a lot of the superficial layer of earth and of and, uh, rocks and also it always exposes new surface uh, layers every year. So the fossils were already there ready to be recovered. The, the bad thing is that most of them are quite fragmented because of that as well. Yes. I'm interested in the so for earthquake probes. Um, it seems like the islands were above the surface of the ocean, above the surface of the water. And with the, the current talks of global warming, with the sea level rising, like it just seems like... Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a lot of land that, that was under the water and now is... Exposed? Yeah, above it because of the freezing. Oh, uh, actually... Okay, so uh, actually most of the islands are volcanic islands. So some of them were not present at that time. Okay. Some one, some of them were, such as Jane Morris. But uh, at that time, it's actually curious because the sea level uh, changes were not necessarily uh, following the changes in ice in Antarctica, or uh, of course it followed the climate on 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 Earth. But uh, some parts of Antarctica were a little bit higher. Uh, today they are a little bit lower in relation to the sea level in relation to uh, if you compare to that side. It's because the actual five kilometers layer of ice sunk part of Antarctica. So actually Jamaica's island now is an island. At that time it was it, it was uh, the bottom of the ocean actually. So most of the dinosaurs and the materials that we found over there were either um, Carried to the ocean by rivers or, or rainfall or something like that, or they were marine animals like the fish, shark, and dinosaurs that we found. So it's uh, actually a mixture of both. So at that time, because the sea level was much higher, then uh, today it's much lower, so that's why it's something over the surface. But at the same time, the continent is a little bit lower because this. I is actually some part of the continent, so it's kind of a huge mixture. Yeah, but it's interesting to talk about global warming because this, uh, this region is actually hugely affected by global warming. So actually some areas that were being explored by paleontologists, which are free of ice today, were not uh, free of ice 100 years ago. So unfortunately, we have more room to do to so are you secretly hoping for more global work? <laughs> yeah, so everything else will be kind of, uh, we don't hope that. No. All right, so that's all the, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all the time we have for questions. But if you want to talk to you, I know, after this, and then just approach them. Yeah, sure. All right.